Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. See, I did not say the rest of it. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Okay, I'm going to just start by saying hi there. This is Leonard Peikoff. That's how I start my radio show. It's shorter than saying all the possible time zones. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to OCON 21. Uh, I understand that you're working on OPAR, this convention, uh, this conference, at least as one of your main things. And I appreciate that. Thank you. And I wish you the best. So don't you wish he was coming up on stage right now? That would be cool. I certainly do. All right, it's, it's great to see everybody. It's great to be here. It's, uh, it's amazing uh, how many of you I know only in two dimensions. And it's been a real thrill to learn that there's a third dimension to you as well. Uh, I'm done. I've, I've had it with Zoom. I'm sure I'll be doing lots of more Zooms. But this is so much more fun. This is so much better. So uh, thanks. So you know, holding a philosophy, living by a philosophy, integrating a philosophy into your life, it's hard. It's hard under any circumstances. It would be hard in Atlantis. It's work. It requires effort and focus. But we live in a world that's not Atlantis, unfortunately. We live in a world in which we're continuously bombarded with the opposite ideas with challenges to ideas, whether it comes from the news and what's happening around the world, or whether it comes from our family, our friends, our colleagues, our bosses. There's a constant challenge to everything we believe. And holding that philosophy, it, it, it's difficult. It takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of effort, and it takes reminding ourselves of the value of the philosophy and what it actually contains the content of the philosophy. It needs to be kept alive constantly, really all the time. It's so easy to drift away from it as many people have over the decades. It's so easy to succumb to the pressure from the outside and to give up on it. You know, when I read uh, Atlas Shrugged for the first time, I was 16 years old, and it blew my mind. I've told you, I've, I've told this story many times. I mean, it changed everything. It turned my world upside down, uh, and uh, I discovered a, a, a new philosophy for living, but I discovered it at a certain level. I mean, certain ideas, as I understood them at 16, from Atlas Shrugged. And it set me on a path to, to study and to figure out and to investigate and to try to, to, to integrate these ideas into my life and to understand them, to, to get to know them, to, to figure out what they actually were because uh, Atlas Shrugged leaves you with a lot of questions. It leaves you with a lot of answers, <laughs> but also with a lot of questions. And, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm a little older than many of you here, although there's some people who are a little older than me. Um, I mean, in those days, I read it in Israel, and it was impossible to find other Ayn Rand books. And we, we you know, we, a book here and a book there, and, and reading the nonfiction and reading The Fountainhead immediately afterwards. And for three years, I thought I was the only person on planet Earth who took these ideas seriously. I mean, except for the guy who gave me Atlas Shrugged. He was the only person I knew who took these ideas semi, for him it was more semi-seriously. And we'd have conversations, but... It was me studying and, and trying to figure this out and the temptation to, to, to move away the emotions, you know, as I'm struggling with collectivism and altruism and everything else was, was strong. I finally met some objectivists in the early 1980s and we used to get together and, and, and try to study their ideas and discuss them and debate them and so on. But they were all at my level, <laughs> pretty much. And some of them might have known a little bit more, a little bit less. 
But we're all struggling to understand the ideas. And you, you read Ayn Rand, and you read an essay here and an essay there. And yes, I, I mean, it's life-changing, and it's, it's deep, and it's important, but it's hard. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not easy, particularly, again, when, you, when you're raised on a different philosophy, where everything around you is a different philosophy. And I remember coming to my first Ocon, it was called the Thomas Jefferson School back then. On my way to Austin, Texas, uh, I actually went to school a block and a half from here at the business school, not far from here, uh, for six years. And uh, on the way, went to San Diego, it's kind of on the way from Israel, uh, and uh, spent two weeks there. And Dr. Peikoff, this is the first time I'd really heard Dr. Peikoff, right? You know, there were, there were tapes and there were courses, but we didn't have access to them, and I certainly couldn't afford them uh, at the time. You had to rent them, and there were all kinds of rules, and uh, th there was no way I could do that. But actually seeing Dr. Peikoff live, uh, he, did, uh, he, he did a the lecture course on um, uh, objectivism, the state of the art. And it, wow, I mean, it was just a different level. It was just a different, uh, different experience. Steve, Steve was there, that's right. Uh, it was just a different experience um, from, from what, I'd experience with my friends in Israel discussing these ideas. Suddenly, you got a sense there was a real sense of a philosophy and a, and a real sense of an integration and scope. Right? And it's still these were the lectures where he hit a few highlights. It wasn't it wasn't the whole system. And uh, you know it was it was it was quite an experience to suddenly be for two weeks like you guys at Ocon, right, with people who knew a lot more than I did. People who could actually, we could have a conversation that I could learn from uh, ab about objectivism. Uh, many of the speakers, or some of the speakers who are here, uh, were there in, uh, in, uh, at TGS. That was 1987. I then moved to Austin, and uh, we continued to discuss and debate but it was always, it was always something missing. It was work. It was, it was difficult to integrate it all, to hold it all as a unit. And then OPA was published in 1991. Now, what does OPA achieve? OPA, the philosophy, objectivism, the philosophy of Ayn Rand, just so we're clear, right? <laughs> what does OPA achieve? It achieves this unit economy. It, it gives you one book, and the philosophy is there from beginning to end. It is well de it's developed, concretized, made real for all of us. It's accessible. We can all read it, understand, and start seeing how the whole system is one integrated whole. Now, Ayn Rand is the genius who discovered the philosophy, who articulated it, who explained it, who taught it to the circle of people around her. She is the one in a millennium genius. But she needed a student, somebody to take her ideas and teach us those ideas. She was not going to write the philosophy in a book, the systematic presentation of philosophy. She didn't do it. She never wrote that definitive book articulating the ideas. And yet, we need that definitive book. We need that unity. We need that whole. Leonard Peikoff, in uh, 30 Years with Ayn Rand, writes, only ideas organized into a logical structure can be tied to reality, and only such ideas, therefore, can be of use or value to man. All these ideas organized, logically, tied to reality, so that we can use them, so that we can live by them. Well, this is what Leonard, and I, I once in a while I'll slip and call him Leonard, Dr. Peikoff, took on himself to understand objectivism thoroughly and to communicate objectivism to all of us.
And we're here today to celebrate that achievement as represented in OPA, and I think represented in all the courses that built up to OPA and built from OPA onwards. So what did Lena have to do to achieve this massive integration and this amazing organization of the content? Well, first, draw on all of Ayn Rand's writings, from the novels to the nonfiction, to some of the nonfiction that's never been published in book form, in the objectivist and the newsletter, and so on, and bring that all together, draw out of it the philosophical principles, and organize them, and structure them, and put them into the right hierarchy. But not everything that Ayn Rand thought not everything that she even taught with regard to objectivism, with regard to the philosophy, is in those articles and in those books. Maybe implicit, but not explicit. She also gave seminars to groups, to, 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 to the group of friends that were with her. She often spoke and had discussions and debates. And that had to be recalled and brought in. And then finally, and I think this is, you know, one of Leonard's, uh, Dr. Peacock's great achievements, is that from early on, from really his first meeting with Ayn Rand, Leonard started asking questions and never stopped. From everything that everybody tells me and from his stories, he would ask a question, he would get Ayn Rand's explanation, then there were things he wouldn't understand, so he would go back and ask more questions, and he would write it down. He would write all this down. And by doing that, he in a sense forced Ayn Rand to think about what was, to her, obvious. That she could just see. That it was just there, and for everybody else, it wasn't. But he was the one who asked the questions. That integrity, that honesty that's involved in knowing what you don't know, in knowing where your own gaps of knowledge are, is one of Leonard's great virtues and is reflected in Opa because it's from those conversations, from that prodding, that I think some of what Ayn Rand actually wrote in the nonfiction came, but that's where Leonard drew in order to complete OPA, to fill in the gaps. He drew from those conversations. Of course, in 1976, he gave a series of lectures on the philosophy of objectivism, kind of tying the whole thing in, the precursor to OPA. And Ayn Rand was there. She was in the audience, but she was also backstage, in a sense, helping, answering questions. She appeared many times in the Q&As. And she declared that course the only, the only really systematic presentation of her philosophy. So, Leonard took all that information, and in 1984, he sat down and decided, okay, I'm going to do something pretty simple. Right? I'm going to transcribe my 1976 talks, my lectures. Ayn Rand was there. It's authoritative. It's finalized, and I'm just going to transcribe them. I'll do a little bit of editing, and we'll publish it. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it turns out that as, he was, as these were transcribed, as he was starting to edit, he discovered there were better ways to formulate, better ways to structure, more consistent ways to integrate, more consistent ways to validate, and what turned into a simple maybe a year or two project, slowly got expanded and expanded and turned into a seven-year project. And you can tell when you read the book. You can tell the precision in which he writes, the effort that went into it, the dedication that goes into it, the clarity of writing, the beauty of the writing. This is not a transcript of a talk. Anybody who's ever given a talk and then gets a transcript afterwards, it's embarrassing, right? <laughs> You want to immediately go back and edit it. You can't do that. But, so he spent those years 
organizing, prioritizing, refining the language. Every word mattered. Every word counted. And of course, validating everything, proving it to us, the reader. And this is, of course, Leonard's unique genius. A, his prodding of Ayn Rand, getting the content, and then having the ability, the brilliance, to sit down and organize it and structure and deliver it in a way that we all can understand, that we all can learn from, that we all cannot hold objectivism as a unit. We have a book that represents what objectivism carries. So, the way Opa is structured is hierarchically. We get the hierarchy of objectivism from metaphysics to epistemology to ethics politics, and of course, aesthetics. And within each one of those branches, the presentation is hierarchical. Right? There's a logic to it. For example, in epistemology, we start with the senses, the validity of the senses, the theory of concept formation, the concept of objectivity, and of course, leading up to reason. We look at the ethics. We start with the nature of man, and then we go to the good, virtue, and the payoff, the moral purpose of life, happiness. So the book is structured based on the hierarchy. But at no point are any of these concepts kind of floating abstractions. I've seen, I've seen uh, objectivists, maybe it's been a long time since I've seen one of these, yeah, present these, try to do these graphs and charts and, and arrows and all these concepts, as, as, and they're completely floating, not attached to anything. But at every point in the book, Dr. Peacock brings in relevant facts, the concretes to prove and to validate the particular point. We always have a reference to reality. We're never left with an abstraction or tied to everything else. And of course, we know that to validate, we must reduce the reality. Leonard, Ayn Rand teaches us that in Introduction to Objective Epistemology, and Leonard reinforces that in OPA. We need to reduce to reality, but then we need to integrate with the rest of our knowledge. In OPA, the ideas are constantly being integrated. Every new point is integrated with all the previous points. So for example, take the chapter on capitalism towards the end of OPA. Okay. I mean, capitalism obviously, sometimes, often, is presented as a standalone kind of unit. You know, we talk about politics, economics, and kind of standalone. But not in OPA. It rests completely on a theory of government, on a, moral, on a morality of egoism, on an objective epistemology, and on a primacy of existence. Indeed, capitalism is a system of a privacy of existence. And private, primacy of existence leads inevitably to capitalism. And that's what Leonard shows us in OPA. If you think about the subtitles under capitalism. Capitalism is the only moral social system. Capitalism is a system of objectivity. Opposition to capitalism is dependent on, what would you say, altruism, bad economics, you know, Keynes. What is it in OPA? There's a bad epistemology. Opposition to capitalism as dependent on a bad epistemology. Now, it's enough to read those subtitles of the chapter on capitalism to know that we are not libertarians. <laughs> they wouldn't even understand what we're talking about. And the chapter on moral social system, Lenin not only shows the dependence of the ideas of capitalism and freedom on a particular view of morality, but then he shows how capitalism, 
the system of freedom reinforces all those moral, value, moral, moral values and virtues. Then indeed, to practice the virtues fully, one must be free. One must live under capitalism. And he goes through every single one of the virtues and shows what it means to be independent under freedom versus to struggle to be independent when force is exerted upon you by the mixed economy or the statists. And he does this for every single one of the virtues. Capitalism is a system of objectivity. covers the objectivity of values. And why? Capitalism is consistent with Rand's theory of concept formation. Why well, it's consistent with the idea of objectivity. Indeed, everything in OPA is integrated around the core of Ayn Rand's philosophy, which is her epistemology. Everything is there to show how a theory of concepts gives rise to this entire philosophy. And Leonard has a whole chapter on objectivity. After all, <laughs> this is the philosophy of objectivism. And yet, Rand didn't write much about objectivity. There's not much in the corpus on objectivity. So a lot of the material in this chapter is new. It's what Leonard got from Ayn Rand directly. And think about the subheading. I mean, I love this subheading. It's probably my favorite in the entire book. Um, in, the, in the chapter on objectivity. This is the objectivity. What is objectivity, right? Objectivity as volitional adherence to reality by the method of logic. Objectivity as volitional adherence to reality by the method of logic. Think about how much is compressed into that sentence. We've got volition. Free will is essential to objectivity and therefore essential to everything about our philosophy. Volition is at the core, the heart of everything. Nothing is meaningful without it. But it's not any, anything. It's not whim in a sense. It's volition as adherence to reality. You've got what? What axiom? You've got the primacy of existence. Reality is what we must adhere to. And by what method? Well, by the method of reason, by the method of logic. The unique cognitive tool that human beings have. So in one sentence, in not even a sentence, a, a, a subheading, he conveys so much and so much integration, so much of the, of the heart of the philosophy, the metaphysics and epistemology on which everything else is built is conveyed just then. Of course, then there's a whole chapter that articulates the case, that explains it, that concretizes it, that integrates it. So this new understanding of obje objectivity, which is new to Ayn Rand, is presented to us in OPA, I think really for the first time as a whole, as a unit, as something I think we can all start to understand. She shows that this new concept informs her entire philosophy. And if you look at the sub-chapters that come afterwards, if you look at how he ties this back, so here I'm just going to read you some of the sub chapters from later chapters. Notice the reference to epistemology and metaphysics. Right? Values as objective. Independence as a primary orientation to reality. Honesty is the rejection of unreality. Primacy of existence. Sex as metaphysical. Statism is the politics of unreason. Capitalism is a system of objectivity. Opposition to capitalism is dependent on bad epistemology. We've covered these. Art 
is the concretization of metaphysics and aesthetics, aesthetic value as objective. And here we see how unique objectivism is. It is a system. It's a system that is integrated, a one, a whole. It's not libertarianism. It's not virtue ethics. It's not any specific thing. It's one whole. Take out any one unit and it falls apart. It is an integrated philosophical system, unique in the history of ideas. Even the polemics that Leonard presents, he presents in a very essentialized way. The book is not a polemical book. It's presenting a positive theory. But he shows that almost all the bad ideas that, have, that haunt all of us <laughs> in the modern world come from, again, epistemology, from the intrinsic subjective for either being intrinsic or being subjective. These are at the heart of all these errors. And if you want to understand the root of evil in the world, you have to look at these ideas. He uses the polemics throughout, and, and every chapter there's a section of polemics towards the end, to contrast objectivism, to highlight what objectivism is adding, the value that it provides to our life, and how and in what way it's opposed to almost everything else that's out there on the ideological spectrum. So the polemics serve to highlight the philosophical achievement of objectivism and to increase our understanding through contrast. Think of the chapter on virtues. It's 75 pages long. That doesn't include the section on rationality, which is in the previous chapter. So it's 75 pages basically dedicated to six virtues, plus the evil of the initiation of force. In Gold's speech, the virtues are discussed in two and a half pages. Leonard takes these virtues and chews them for us breaks them down, concretizes them, integrates them, shows their relevance to your life, and shows why you must hold them on principle. Leonard writes, oh Paul, we have 75 pages, but that then becomes a basis for, let's say, Dr. Smith's book, a whole book on the virtues. Now take the virtue of integrity, for example. In Gold's speech, it's one paragraph. I was going to read you the paragraph, but I encourage you to read it yourself. It's an amazing paragraph on the virtue of integrity. But it is incredibly abstract. It's hard. I mean, I had to read it now two or three times to really grasp what she's getting at. Lena takes that paragraph turns it into seven pages, where he explores exactly what integrity is, he explains it, he concretizes it, he boils it down to its essentials. One of my favorite kind of um, uh, condensations that he has in all of Opa is when he says that integrity, uh, just think about it, I mean, just think about this play on words and, and his ability with the English language. Integrity is the principle a being principled. Well, think about that. That's exactly what integrity is. He contrasts the idea with moral compromise in, this, in these seven pages. He discusses the nature of evil. And then he concludes by showing us that intrinsicism and subjectivism are incompatible with integrity. They necessitate compromise that that's the whole point. That the virtue of integrity is an impossibility if one accepts these epistemological views. Again, everything is tied to the epistemology. Now, I was going to read you a section 
because I was reading the, the, the section on integrity, and if somebody wants, I'll read it in the Q&A. And how, one paragraph that just struck me because of what's going on right now in Afghanistan, and you know I, I'm always thinking about those things. And there's a paragraph there about foreign policy that is so relevant to what's happening right now. It's so relevant to what we're living through right now, the horrors that we're living through right now. But I, I'll leave that. If somebody's really interested, I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you in the Q&A. OPA is filled with topics that Ayn Rand talks about. Again, these are all Ayn Rand's ideas, but she does not elaborate on. We talked about the virtues or even the 15 pages on the initiation of physical force as evil. The chapter or sub-chapter on the arbitrary is neither true or false. Knowledge and certainty is contextual. Reason is man's basic means of survival, not just something in your head, not just something to kind of understand the world, but as a guide to action. Reason as a guide to action. Why one should act on principle. There's a fantastic talk Dr. Peacock gave at Fort Hall Forum, I think, and that was turned into an essay on why one should act on principle. Everybody should read that essay. It is, is it's a truly, it's important. Uh, and, and it contributes to your life. Now, all this is in Ayn Rand. It's certainly in the novels. I mean, I said that Ayn Rand only devotes a paragraph to it in Gold's speech, but think about it. What's the fountainhead about? It's about integrity and independence. But it's not, it's not presented as such. It's hard to hold as such when one is thinking about one's life about the philosophy as a philosophy. So Leonard explains, expands, integrates, concretizes, formulates. He does what a great teacher does. He's teaching us. And one of the amazing things about Opal is how well it is written, how essentialized, how clear, it's super exact and precise philosophically, and yet it's accessible. It presents a digestible unit. Objectivism is a digestible unit, unit as a philosophical system that all of us can integrate. He gives us enough detail, but never causing you to lose sight of where you're heading, of the system as a whole, of the forest. You never get bogged down by the trees and lose sight of that forest. It's interesting. It's all concretized. It's written in beautiful English. It truly is a masterpiece that I think Dr. Peikoff was probably the only person who could have written it. There's nobody else. This is 30 years ago. It's what we're celebrating here at Ocon. Over those 30 years, OPA has become the textbook, the way to study and learn objectivism. I mean, one of my goals today is to encourage you who haven't read Ocon, Ocon, OPA, too many acronyms, to read it. And those of you who have, to read it again. But it's more than just reading. So I got my copy when it first came out in 1991. I still have it. I didn't bring it with me because it's falling apart. It's one of those hardback covers that if you open it too many times, starts falling apart. Uh, everything's outlined. Every paragraphs are numbered. Because I read it immediately when it came out, but then I realized that you can't just read it. You now have to study it. So here in Austin, you know, about, I don't know, 20 minutes. And I, I, my sense of direction is completely off here. So somewhere there. Close to 360 in uh, John and Gail Withrow's house. And I think their daughter is here. Um, Kira Withrow. We started a study group. And we'd get together every Sunday for a year and studied OPA. Went over it section by section. Some of you, there are a few faces here that were there and who participated in that study group. 
later, in the mid, this is in 1992, in the mid-90s, OPA was the textbook for, in my OGC education. Three years with Dr. Harry Binswang as our teacher, going over OPA. It took us three years because there's so much there. And of course, since then, I've gone back to it over and over again. Anytime I had a question, the lexicon and OPA, and of course, you're reading Ayn Rand and everything else, but OPA is a place where you can quickly look or you can read again and see the integrations if you're not sure. And of course, at the Institute, at ARI, OPA is, uh, is the heart of the curriculum in all of our courses, starting from its publication, my class in the OGC in the, the mid-1990s, and then continuing when the OAC was a one-year program. It was a one-year program about o OPA. When, OG, when uh, o OAC was a three-year program, one of those years was OPA. When OAC was a, t you know, it's changed, uh, four-year, three-year, two-year, one-year. But in all cases, OPA was at the heart of the education. All the intellectuals, the younger intellectuals here, were, in a sense, raised on OPA, educated through OPA, really dug into the philosophy through OPA. It's the book that is, I think, at the end of the day, created a movement. When somebody says, what is objectivism? Here it is. This is objectivism. If somebody wants to reckon with the philosophy, critique the philosophy, engage with the philosophy, it's Ocon that they're going to have to deal with. They're going to have to reckon with. So over the last 30 years, OPA has had a profound impact on me personally as an intellectual. No way my intellectual path would be what it was without OPA. My understanding was nowhere near as good pre to post, and every time I've studied it, my understanding has grown, gotten deeper, better integrated. And, and look, objectivism is a lifelong pursuit. It's not something you're done with. But no way would have I gotten to where I am without it. And I think that is true of all the intellectuals that are here today with us. It is a true historic achievement. It's truly unique in the history of philosophy to have a book that presents a systematic philosophy, the scope, the readability. I mean, think about how readable it is as compared to almost any other philosopher out there. I mean, that's true of Ayn Rand, and it's true of Lena Peikoff. You know, I, I, I asked some of our intellectuals, um, what else comes close, and, and there's nothing else. Because if you look at people who've tried to do systematic presentations, it's almost impossible to read. It's really, really hard. It's certainly not something anybody can approach. Most of us can approach. You have to be a pro. I mean, imagine what would have happened if Aristotle had had a student who systematically taught Aristotle after Aristotle died. I asked Robert Mayhew if that was the case, and no, it wasn't. I suspect the world would be a different world today if Aristotle had a Leonard Peikoff. We do have a Lena Peikoff. We do have an OPA, and we should be thankful for them. In his 30 years um, of Ayn Rand, Leonard writes about Ayn Rand. And I quote, her universe was a single whole with all its parts interrelated and intelligible, unquote. Now we can all strive to make our lives that way. 
whole, interrelated, intelligible. But when it comes to the philosophy of objectivism, Leonard now has given us the tool to make it whole, to make it intelligible, to make it interrelated, to make it our own. To be able to use it and apply it to our own life, to make the philosophy really yours. So I think we all owe Dr. Peacock a thank you. Thank you for not giving up on asking Ayn Rand questions, on getting all that she took, that she had implicitly, that she took in a sense as obvious or for granted, and making it explicit. Thank you for writing this amazing book so that we can now integrate these ideas into our lives and make this philosophy our philosophy in a much more complete and whole way than we could have without it. Thank you for being our teacher, for teaching us this philosophy, for doing it so well. We can never really repay Dr. Pigar for everything he's given us in that sense. But thank you, Leonard. Now I'm going to end with a, a story, a quick story that uh, Harry told me, Harry Binswear, said that, you know, shortly before Ayn Rand passed away, Harry said to, to Ayn, to Rand, to Miss Rand, um, if only we had 10 Leonard Peikoffs, we would take over the world. And Ayn Rand looked at him, you know, with a little bit of scorn and, and disappointment. It's like, what do you mean? If we had two Leonard Peikoffs, we would take over the world. Well, I hate to disagree with Ayn Rand, and I almost never do it, but you only have one Leonard Peikoff, we only have one Opa, and we will take over the world. Thank you all. Yeah, you should give a standing ovation, not to me, but to Leonard. We should have his picture up. Okay, we have time for Q&A. Oh, wow, already, all right. Hi. So let me just say, which I should have said at the beginning, I'm not a philosopher. Don't ask me what's man on page five, you know, uh, so uh, keep, the, keep the questions at the, at, the, at the level and status that I can answer them. Yes. I, I am a philosopher. Yes, so you I'll are. Just, so I'll, I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll offer a comment because it's difficult to really kind of concretize what it means to have a hierarchical structure. I think you pointed out quite rightly all the places where in later chapters they refer back to earlier chapters. Yep. But I, here is an anecdote. So some of the younger, you know, not so younger anymore, um, <laughs> philosophers and I, um, we tried one time of the Opar babies, as, as Greg likes to call us. Those of us, those of us who started studying objectivism once Opar already existed, so that it was a resource from the very beginning yeah. to us. Um, well, one time we tried to play this old objectivism parlor game called Concepts in a Hat. And the idea of this game that people played in Rand's salon was they would take different principles, different concepts of hers, put them on strips of paper, put them in a hat, and you'd pull out two, and you'd have to state how they were integrated in rhyme. And <laughs> in rhyme. Now, we, we, didn't do the, we didn't do the whole thing, because nobody wanted to sit there and tear up pieces of paper. But somebody picked some things out of the, out of the index of OPAR or anything. And we found that, for us, it was sort of trivial to state the connections between them in a way that you know, the game was originally meant to be hard. 
and sort of re we reflected on it, like, why is this so easy? Are we just so good at philosophy? Probably. <laughs> but, but in fact, it was really because of OPAR, because we, for, we didn't have to study objectivism from Galt's speech, which, great though it is, is not kind of designed to present a philosophy so much as to state reasons for a, you know, a strike, right? Um, we had this book that was sort of top down, or, or bottom up, yeah. um, and, and sort of had the whole system together. And just to see how easy it was to see the connections really kind of showed just how powerful it was for us in learning and mastering the, the philosophy at a conceptual level. That's a great example. Thank you. Good morning, Yaron. Thank you for that awesome Hi, talk. Thank you. Um, so I would be curious to hear about that paragraph you referred to in the <laughs> section on integrity, uh, about foreign policy and how it relates to Afghanistan. Well, I, I, I'm not going to have to say anything. You'll, get, you, you'll see how it relates to Afghanistan as I read it. Now, he's just talked about why you can't compromise with a burglar. And he says, an obvious similarity exists between this case and that of a country, able to defend itself, which decides nevertheless to negotiate with an aggressor, agreeing to some of the latter's arbitrary demands in the name of being flexible and preserving peace. Such a country thereby invites more demands to be answered by more flexibility. It is doomed from the start assuming it does not change its policy. By conceding the propriety of some aggression, it has dropped the principle of self-defense and its own sovereignty, which leaves it without moral grounds to object to the next depredation. So, uh, and he says in parentheses, the alternative to such capitulation is not necessarily war, which is absolutely true. On the contrary, a free nation's strength, moral and military, is its greatest deterrent to war. And if you think about, you know, there are no words to describe the treason, the, the, the horror of, of what, we do, what we've been doing for years, what the last two administrations have done in Afghanistan to bring us to the point where, you know, just the other day, what, uh, uh, 13 Marines died for what? Uh, all avoidable, all preventable, and, and, and the United States is now, from a foreign policy, policy perspective, n nothing. I mean, it's, it's, it's just any strength and, and that, it, that it might have projected in the past is, is finished. It's, it's, a, it's hard to describe how much of a disaster this is. Uh, and it's, it's right there in the paragraph. I mean, it's once you start compromising, you know, uh, Biden literally sent... Uh, the, 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 the Taliban, a list of the people, the Afghans he wants to evacuate. Talk about having a kill list now of who they're gonna, who they're gonna destroy. I mean, things like that, and this is a peace, we've got a peace treaty with them, we've been negotiating with them, we've been, uh, the CIA director met with, uh, with, with one of them. You know, these are people who are dedicated to killing Americans, dedicated to destroying our system of government, dedicated to everything we're against. And we have the military power. It's not like we're some weak country that has to go. We have, and we, you know, don't get me started. We're celebrating, you know. Thank you. Your own, we have, your own, we have an online question next. Where are you? I can't see you. Back here. Oh, there, okay. Yeah. So the question is, many hesitate to fully get into and study objectivism because it's, because it's not very popular. Dr. Peikoff, of course, recognized the revolutionary nature of Rand's ideas when he first encountered it as a young man. What qualities in him do you think enabled him to do that? You know, it's, it's a real question. Why do some of us read Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead in Dr. Peikoff's case? And it just, it, it changes our world. And other people read Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead and say, oh yeah, yeah, that was good. And they just go on in life. And other people read it and say, oh, I don't like that. And I, and I don't know. I wish I knew exactly what it was. But I'd, I'd have to say that at the core of it has to be some sense of intellectual honesty. Some uh, a, a courage to declare every, 
everything that you see around you and everything you believed in wrong, or at least probably wrong, so that you're investigating this new idea. And some, um, some hero worship, you know, a, a real desire to see heroes, which is what Ayn Rand gives us. She gives us heroes. And through those heroes, she teaches us of a different way to live our lives. So there's, it's a combination of courage, honesty, intellectual honesty, deep, deep intellectual honesty that allows you to, make the, to question these things. And this desire, uh, you know, maybe for, for in your own life to be a hero or to see heroes in your life, or maybe both. So it's, it's some, some combination of those things, I think, is what makes I, I, us different than everybody else who reads Ayn Rand who, who is not affected by it, which has always been a mystery to, it, to me. I mean, when I read it at 16, and I'm sure you experienced this, I thought, okay, I'll just show this to everybody else, and they'll get it. This is just a matter of time now, right? This is so obvious. And um, it's not, <laughs> obviously. Yes. Hey, you're on. Um, yeah, okay, it's on. If, uh, if civilization were to crumble and only one book could survive, <laughs> would you rather it be Atlas Shrugged or Opar? <laughs> That's not fair. Um, no, but the answer is obvious. It would be Atlas Shrugged. Okay. You can recreate Opar. I mean, you would have to be a brilliant and you would have to, you know, it would take who knows how long and everything, but I don't know that you can recreate that experience. Everything that that Atlas Shrugged ties together the, 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 the unbelievable aesthetic quality of an Atlas Shrugged. You, that, is, that, that is not matched. That cannot be matched. So I, I, I would have to say Atlas Shrugged. But let's, uh, let's make sure that never happens. And we never face that choice. Um. Do you have any recommendations on, first, at what stage in your studies of objectivism, and then by what method people should read OPAR and study it? So, I'd say once you've read the novels and, and the, key, um, the key essays, the nonfiction essays of Ayn Rand's, uh, I would say OPAR would be next, so the key being, um, you know, the... the, the objectivist ethics, uh, what is capitalism, philosophy, certainly philosophy who needs it, which I think grounds the need for philosophy. Um, I'm sure there's a few others that I'm missing, but, but once you read a few of those core, I think it's time to get to, uh, to, to Opa, among other things, because, I mean, I, I find, for example, <laughs> uh, Ayn Rand's essay, What is Capitalism?, to be one of the hardest essays. Um, I, I, you know, it, it takes me a lot it takes a lot to understand, and I think, I think uh, reading OPA helps understand what is capitalism. Um, and, and if you think about the objectivist ethics, which is unbelievably condensed, it is a, is a relatively short essay, um, and, uh, and then you, you think about the number of chapters that Dr. Peacock dedicates to the ethics in, um, in OPA, again, you get, you get that reinforcement, you get that uh, back and forth. How to study it? I mean, I like the idea of study groups. I, I, I like the idea of getting a small group together uh, and, and going through it because I think other people's questions often, so often you read something and it just seems obvious to you. It's, it's, it seems right to you, right? It just, it just clicks. But you don't really think about it. And, and somebody else, it might not be seem obviously, somebody might ask a question about it and suddenly you're forced to uh, confront the fact that you don't really know it, it just, you just read it, it kind of makes sense and, and you just went on. And, and uh, Opa is very well written, so there is, it's good to take the time to slow down and to stop and to really, really think in a study group in a sense, forces you to do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of doing that. Of course, I think Tal would appreciate this. You can also audit the OAC, uh, where, they're going over, where they're going over the uh, uh, OPA, and, and that, that would be a great way to do it as well. Thank you. Another uh, online question about other study resources, and this one comes from someone else named Jeroen. While OPAR was how I originally started to study objectivism, I have since also learned to listen to OTI, uh, Objectivism Through Induction, 
and understanding objectivism. How does one integrate all of these and other resources since each one has a different approach to studying objectivism? And there's a follow-up question from someone else. Uh, will OTI ever be transcribed or edited into a book? Objectivism through induction. Um, I don't know if it'll ever be uh, edited into a book. Uh, look, they're all uh, different approaches. OTI is objectivism through induction. It is a course that uh, Dr. Peacock did in the uh, late 1990s, mid to late 1990s, um, in where he uh, presents a number of the principles of objectivism and shows how they are induced from the facts of reality. Usually what we do is reduction. We take, we take the principle and then reduce it down, going down level by level of abstraction down to the concretes. Here you, you, you start with the concrete. What kind of concretes, what kind of examples, what kind of things would you have to observe in reality to induce the more abstract and then, the more ab and then what abstractions would you have to induce to get to this higher level abstraction? And I, I, I think that's a very advanced course. So I would say that's something you should do after you've really integrated the philosophy. And the reason is, it's the only person who's actually induced objectivism, really induced objectivism, is Ayn Rand. So while it has incredibly helped to make the philosophy real to you, first you have to learn, I think, the philosophy. And then uh, learn how to induce it. So I would say that would be late. At least that's, that's my best sense of that. Um, so I, is that the, is, did I answer the question, Ben? I don't know where you yeah, are. I think oh, you're hiding the back major there. Parts. What's that? There was also about understanding objectivism, if you want to say something about that. Yes, I mean, understanding it, objectivism is another perspective on studying objectivism, where the primary value, or, or not the primary value, a value of it is to avoid certain errors in studying objectivism. Primarily rationalism, for most of us, rationalism is the issue. For some of us, empiricism, but usually it's rationalism. And rationalism is this idea that the concepts are floating, that they're not tied to reality. You haven't done the work to reduce them to reality. So it's, it's really a heavy emphasis on do it right, really integrate and reduce. Get a, a, you know, make the philosophy yours. Don't allow your concepts to stay floating. So. I, you know, I think understanding objectivism is one of uh, Dr. Peacock's most important courses. Because look, we're all rationalists in the beginning. We really, I mean, you can't not be. Because you read Atlas Shrugged, and you, you have a, a, an entire life's philosophy handed to you on a silver platter. It's, it's right there. And all these abstract ideas, yes, they're concretized through a story, but, but you get excited about these abstract ideas, this, these philosophical ideas. You don't have the life experience to know what they really connect to in reality. You've got one story. And then it's, a, it's in a sense a life work now to figure out what these things, what these ideas really mean and how to tie them to reality. And that takes work. It takes time. Uh, so... Initially, I mean, when I was 16, I read Atlas Shrugged, I, I thought I knew everything. That's it, right? I, I, I knew objectivism, I knew philosophy, it explained everything. And it took me years to figure out all the things I didn't know and how, to what extent these ideas were floating abstractions and to what extent I really had to tie them to reality and, and connect them to the facts. And, and uh, it, 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 it takes time. So because of the way we're presenting with the philosophy, we're almost always going to be rationalistic. And I think understanding objectivism is, a, is, a, is an important tool in uh, making that real to you, so facing it, and then undoing, undoing it. And, and, and again, figuring out what these, all these abstract ideas really mean. Hey, you're on. Hey. I feel weird not super chatting you, but uh, three questions. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, how much? I, how much? I've got $20 if you'd like it. I can't, I can't solicit here, so it has to go to tall. <laughs> so um, I, and, uh, I think we all share the same frustration when we run across people who have read Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead and dismiss it, and uh, I've, either they don't like the philosophy or they don't like the writing style. And I always recommend, well, you should really read Ayn Rand's nonfiction works as well. Better yet, read Opar. 
I am curious if in your entire history of either of studying this or in any university and philosophy classes, if anybody has actually read OPAR and come up with any kind of critique, like real critique of it? Um, not that I know of. Uh, I'm sure people have tried and I'm sure there's stuff out there on the web that you can probably find, but, but no, I haven't seen anything. Um, no, and, and look, some people do come to objectivism through the nonfiction and not through the fiction. Uh, and, and to some people, somehow the fiction doesn't affect them, and the nonfiction gets them somehow. I don't understand that because <laughs> you know it's so much the other way around for me. But um, but that, so that path is possible. So referring them to the nonfiction is definitely definitely a good strategy. But no, I haven't seen any real critique of it. Hi there. Hey. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was just kind of thank you because my first OCON, um, Leonard, Dr. Peacock was presenting um, his dim hypothesis and it was really through him that I deeply connected with the philosophy and I came to this hoping that you would do justice to my experience with him and I was like, yeah, but who can do justice to Leonard Peacock? And you did such a beautiful job oh. and I just really want to thank you. So the thank standing you. I was definitely for him, but also thank you for doing justice to, to what he's accomplished. Um, It's also really nice to just see the admiration um, and it's just, it's a beautiful thing to bear witness to. And then the second thing was to do justice to people. I'm not one of them, so this is not like, I'm not being defensive. <laughs> um, but I know people who really didn't have a strong response to Atlas Shrugged or the Fountainhead, um, who had just some of the most beautiful responses to the philosophy that I've ever seen. And one of the reasons, um, and, and some of them have felt guilty because of it. And one of the reasons that I've discovered with a few people that um, I'd worked with is because they didn't know how to engage with art. It wasn't an issue. They actually didn't get what was special. It wasn't coming through to them because they really lacked a literary competency to know what to do with art and how to make sense of things. And when things are challenging in the book, and so much is, they were trained to just gloss over it or to try to fit it into the closest compartment of something that was familiar so that they couldn't experience what was special about it. Um, and so for that, Lisa Van Dam, if you're here, if you struggle with getting value from the novels, um, she's somebody who's great to engage with um, to get better at that. But I just wanted to acknowledge that as a potential reason why people might not respond. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and if anything, I think that's only going to get worse, unfortunately, because we live in a very cynical era and kids grow up on, on um, South Park and, and The Simpsons. And it's, it's it, you know, if you grow up on, on the cynicism that it's in our arts, that it's everywhere, it's very hard then to appreciate, I think. It's very hard to appreciate the, the ideal, you know, it, the, 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 the romanticism. Romanticism is just so foreign to them. It's so strange because everything that's being produced, not everything, but almost everything, is so cynical um, that it's, yes, it's hard for them to comprehend what it is that's being conveyed through the arts. Another online question, your own. Yep. Do you have any idea how many copies of OPAR roughly have been sold in the U.S. and worldwide since uh, its publication? I don't. So that's a question for. I'm just gonna ask Tal to find out. <laughs> Somebody at the institute knows. So um, it's just a matter of sending the email to the right person and, and figuring that out. So thanks for asking the question. We'll try to get you an answer later in the conference. How about that? Yes. Hello, Ron. Uh, again. Uh, and, and it has been translated, by the way, into a number of, uh, of languages. So it's in, uh, it's in Spanish now. In the first translation, I mean, it's in Czech. Uh, an objectivist who usually is at Ocon, but it's probably not here because of COVID uh, was responsible for it being translated to Czech. It's in uh, Portuguese in, in Brazil um, and in one or two other languages, I'm pretty sure, but, uh, but certainly in those three. Yeah. Um, you already touched this um, a couple of minutes ago, but I would like to ask the question in a different way or from a different point of view. Um, when approaching to um, people who aren't really fond of philosophy, uh, how would you present um, Ayn Rand to them um, without them trying to blow her off? It's like, what makes her different as a philosopher? Why, why should I read her instead of Kant? <laughs> Oh, hey, because you can actually read her. <laughs> um, 
Well, what makes a difference is that this is a philosophy for living on earth. It's a philosophy for living. It's a philosophy with guidance to be happy, to living the best life you can live, to, to, to individual flourishing, to, to living well. Uh, and that's, that, you know, but it's a philosophy. It's not just some self-help thing that's, that's floating. It's a philosophy that teaches you how to think and how to think properly. Uh, so it's, it's a philosophy for human beings to be the best human beings they can be. And that, I don't think there's anything, there's no other philosophy like it in that sense. Thank you. One more online question. Yeah. You mentioned that Tara Smith did a whole book on the virtues. What other sections in OPAR would you like to see expanded into books which have not already been discussed by others? I mean, all of it. <laughs> I mean, every subsection should be a book. There's so much there. There's so much work still to be done in objectivism, in, in developing, in concretizing, in explaining, in, in uh, expanding the ideas, the thoughts, there's, there's in every single chapter, it could be a book or, or, or several books. So I don't think there's really a limit to this. Um, there, there are new applications constantly. There's new things to apply these ideas to. Uh, there's so the different contexts in which one could be writing about these ideas. Uh, so yeah, don't, don't stop writing books if, if, uh, if you guys are thinking about writing books. By the way, I think Dr. Smith is doing a talk today on integrity, right? So this afternoon is a talk on integrity, so you'll get a, um, a, a much better sense of integrity uh, from the talk this afternoon. Yeah, Keith. Um, so since I'm the end of the line here, I wanted to just take a minute to talk about um, another way that we're going to be celebrating OPAR at the conference. So could you put the slide up? So we're actually going to have an OPAR quote contest. So there's 10 parts to it. There are 10 general session sessions throughout the conference, including the state of ARI tomorrow. And before and after each session, we're going to put up two questions. Um, and then at the next session, we'll put up the answers to this round, and then the next one, the set of questions after that. So we're not tracking your scores. So as it says up there, winners receive bragging rights and personal satisfaction. The rules are simple. Don't look it up. You know, this is supposed to be sort of for memory or from guessing from the multiple choice. But we wanted to have a way to engage with the book, you know, that would be kind of a fun activity throughout the conference. And also the online audience can participate in this as well. So uh, enjoy the quote contest and, you know, it should be a fun thing throughout the conference. So, and don't call out the answers, please. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not keeping score, people. We don't have like a social score with uh, with uh, facial uh, facial recognition. You can keep your own. You can keep your own score and post your numbers throughout on the Facebook group or something like that. That's All right. Uh, we have an open mic. Nobody's curious that uh, we can end early if if that's the case. All right. Yes. So. I began studying objectivism toward the end of high school. I lived near New York City, so I went to all these things. My dad took me. And so that would have been maybe, unbelievably, 1973-ish. Um, and at that time, over the next few years, I had pretty much read and attended everything related to objectivism through college. And I just wanted to comment that now, all these years later, it's just um, unbelievable to me how this has exploded and how I can't even keep up with how many things there are to read and things there are to go to and people there are to go and see. That I'm incredibly impressed. Well, that's, that, that is absolutely true. And it really is, it's great to hear because, and, and it's, it, it, you know, I, when, when Leonard Peikoff used to, uh, uh, when I ran and then Leonard Peikoff used to do the Fort Hall Forum talks and, and hundreds and sometimes thousands of people would go there. Now first it's, it's granted, it's Leonard Peikoff and Ayn Rand, right? Particularly Ayn Rand. Um, but that was one event. 
a year. And it was pretty much it, particularly if you didn't live in New York City. Uh, today, there are dozens of events, right? Maybe in a known COVID year, hundreds of events. I mean, <laughs> there was a period where I was doing 100 events a year, over 100 events a year. Uh, they are, and again, not to compare myself to Ayn Rand and Leonard Peacock, but, but still just the volume of events, their books, their podcasts, their, 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 there's commentary. And then, of course, there's all the old material. There's all of Leonard Peacock's courses, which are available now for free on YouTube but on, on, on the Ayn Rand campus. Uh, so there's the, the, the volume of material, the quality of the content, particularly all those courses and uh, Ayn Rand interviews, which are now online, you can all, all access. Uh, it, it's just, it truly really is, uh, it truly really is amazing and, and fun to see the number of new intellectuals that we have, the number of young people that are going to be up on this stage in the years to come is really thrilling and exciting. I just did, I just finished a um, public speaking workshop with a number of them and there's real talent and you're going to see them up here again in the years to come and yeah i i think this is you know this is going to continue to grow often when something is exponential you don't know it's exponential until you're well up onto the curve uh but at some point this will become exponential uh so in spite of all my usual pessimism about the state of the world I'm not pessimistic about this. I'm not pessimistic about what we can achieve, what we have achieved, and what we will achieve. Uh, I, I, I think that great things are in our future. Hello, Yaron. Uh, Dr. Hey. Peacock had a very interesting anecdote about how he became on a first name basis with Ayn Rand. <laughs> I wonder if you had a similar experience with Dr. Peacock. <laughs> I don't remember the anecdote with Dr. Peacock and Ayn Rand. Um, but no, I, 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 I have no recollection when that happened uh, and how that happened. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I first met him in 1987. I'm sure he doesn't remember. Um, and uh, I remember I, I was with a friend of mine from Israel and we went to see him um, and had a private meeting with him to try to get the rights to translate Ayn Rand into Hebrew, all her essays. and. It was a, such an easy meeting. I mean, it was, we were prepared for, for real negotiations, and, it was, uh, and, and he basically gave us the right to translate anything we wanted uh, into Hebrew in those days. Um, and then I got to know him really in the mid-1990s um, uh, as a... <laughs> you know, so I, 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 when I left the house, I, I've got, I think, five copies of Opa, one that's falling apart, and then three of these soft covers and, and another hardback cover. And I just grabbed the soft cover and I, I brought it here. And I didn't realize this is the one he signed. Uh, I think the only one he signed. Um, and it's from J J July 1994. And in the context he signed it to me here, I was running an art business. I was selling art posters and art stuff, and, and which Leonard really loved and still has some of the art that I sold him, or we sold him, uh, on his wall in his house today. So I got to know him through that, and I was a student of his, and I'm sure somewhere in that art gallery or somewhere as a student, uh, it, you know, it, I'm also Israeli, so it, it, first name basis comes naturally. <laughs> well, thank you. Hi. Uh, you, your comments about how Atlas Shrugged resonates with some people and not others, that, that really hit hard for me. Thank you for that. And also how you felt completely alone, like the only person who liked these ideas. Um, just thanks for sharing that, because that really resonated with me. But also what you said about how um, one possible uh, theory could be hero worship or, or the need for heroes. I think there's really something there. So if you or anyone else qualified wants to explore <laughs> that, please do that. That sounds like um, a, a really good theory. I, I, I think so. And it's, and it's something that can be, you know, I think we could, do, we could do some surveys, we can do some studies, and we can figure this out. But I definitely think there's something about the hero worshiping uh, growing up 
I mean, I was definitely a hero worshiper as a, as a kid. Uh, I was always looking for heroes. I mean, all the wrong heroes, of course. Um, the ones who like to jump on grenades, but um, <laughs> for some cause. But uh, there was definitely that element of, uh, of, of, of hero worshiping. And, and that just, and, and Atlas shrugged. I mean, how can you not? I mean, that's just my point. No, I can't understand people who don't respond to Atlas. Because how can you not respond to these amazing heroes? And, and heroes in a way and in things that I wouldn't have expected, right? So I grew up, because I grew up in Israel, the heroism was military heroism. Heroism was for the country, for the tribe, for the... For the and here were heroes of industry. Heroes with regard to ideas, heroes with regard to love, heroes in aspects that I'd never considered possible in terms of what heroism meant. And yet, it completely, it clicked. It completely, uh, con I completely connected to it. Right? Thanks, everybody. Have a great conference. <laughs>